the day Bastille Day. So um, uh, happy Bastille Day to all our French friends and everybody else who celebrate with them. I've celebrated them once or twice over there. So um, at any rate, I'm glad you could join us today. And I'm going to go into my uh, PowerPoint presentation and share my screen and stuff. And we'll take it from there, eh? Am I showing okay, everybody? Um, welcome back. Now. Yeah, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Workshop. I want to show you a few things that's happening. Um, today, we're going to be in one of the workshops itself. Uh, the Astro Imaging Channel is, is uh, offering you some free data out there. Um, Terry Robeson gave us some uh, NGC 1968. If you go to our website and you click on this link up here in the upper right hand corner of our website that says workshop it'll come up with a page that looks like this actually tomorrow the page will be different with a different set of challenges but uh tonight um we have the results of uh, actually four people um did the processing from terry's data that you can get at this link and so we're going to have uh, two of those people were able to join us tonight. We have a couple people traveling and working and stuff like that, so they couldn't make it. Uh, Terry's also going to be telling us a little bit about the data, and we're going to we're just going to see how other people process the data. But uh, as always, as part of the show, I want to tell you what's happening. If you haven't been here before, uh, you should be looking at this area down here on, on the website. If you scroll down a little bit, you get to this area. Click on it and start watching and you'll also see this little green and white oval over here this green and white oval tells you that if you click on that you can join us and when you do that you can make comments all the way along and just kind of keep up with this this is called rumble talk and rumble talk costs us some money and we're wondering why we're using it that's why we would prefer actually if you watched us over on um YouTube itself, and by joining the YouTube chat, you can see that you can cut, talk, you know, you can do all this kind of stuff that you're that we're just talking about. Uh, put in your comments, and we can, if you've got a question, you can type it in. We'll put it up on the air and uh, get the presenters to answer them as well as we can and stuff like that. And uh, that's what we'd prefer to have have you do if you can do it, because you know, it's, we, with this Rumble Talk thing is getting to be kind of a useless expense. One of the other links up there uh, at the top of the page is the upcoming shows. And as you can see here, you'll click on that and you'll get this page. It looks, they blew it up a little bit so you can see it better over here. And you can see that in the next couple of weeks, we've got somebody call, call, coming in to tell us about free and low cost software. Bill Lee will be here. TJ Connolly, a real good uh, solar and uh, planetary imager is gonna come in and tell us about uh, Mercury, getting ready for the Mercury solar transit more stuff about PRISM software. And then Richard Wright's gonna be coming in to tell us about some stuff in SkyX. Richard Wright is a very popular author in Sky Intel Magazine. He's been all over. He's a great guy, good, good friend of ours. Um, we'll have another processing workshop. I'll tell you about that a little bit more. And then you can read through some of these yourself. Some of these that we've added um, include and Zabladov, who's going to tell us a little bit about um, citizen contributions to um, science imaging and some stuff like that. Toga's made some. Toga's been really hard at work for you guys, getting some other people to come in, tell us about Deep Sky West and a few other programs. One of the things I wanted to point out to you is that you guys will have a break from us on November 17th. Uh, what you have to pay for that break, of course, is to show up in San Jose, was it San Jose or Santa Clara, wherever it is up there in, in Silicon Valley with us. Uh, yeah, we, we decided we can't really have a show because all of the people who put on the show will be up in Silicon Valley together. And so we, you know, we can't do that. Uh, so we're going to be taking November 17th off, the day before my wife's birthday, in honor of AIC. So that'll be a day off for you. Um, we do have a workshop tonight. It's uh, NGC's 1968. This is today's page. If you were to go to workshop right now, you'd call up this page. Um, tomorrow morning sometime, if I manage to figure out how to do it, last time this completely bollocked up because they had changed how the software did it, but we managed to figure it out with Adam's help. And um, 
uh, I am going to have some of my own work. Now, the last two sessions we've had, or the last few sessions we've had with uh, Terry's data tonight and with Eric's data last time, both of them were data that had been taken over 50, 60, 110 hours or, you know, something, you know, really good, smooth data. This data that you're getting next time is from Alex McConaughey and it's not nearly that quality of data. It is part of a collection of data that I'm making for my uh, Messier Galaxy. I wanted to get all the Messier, or my, 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 my um, Messier uh, um, display in my website. And I'm not trying to get the world's greatest portraits of them. I'm trying to get decent portraits of each one. And so I'm devoting about one night per target. So these are going to be more like the images, but like the data you guys get when you um, when you do your own stuff, when you're out camping, when you're at a star party, and you, you know you're going to try to get three or four images in the course of three or four nights. Um, well, that this is the kind of data you're going to get. It's got problems with um, some bad columns and some noise and stuff like that. And it'll be much more akin to the data that we, we use every day. Anyway, you get a chance to process my data on M13. Here is the link for that data right here. And before too long, I will be putting that up in Rumble Talk so you can all see it and everything will be cool. And uh, let's see, tonight's show, however, is Terry Robeson's data. And we're going to turn it over to Terry here. Terry, you ready to take over? Oh, in fact, I just want to say something before you give it to Oh, Terry. except for Tolga wants to say something. So Tolga, go for it. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, for people who are watching live and chatting on YouTube, uh, right under your name where you type, uh, there's a smiley face. And right next to that, there's a little box with a dollar sign on it. And that's where you show your support for the Astro Imaging Channel. If you see what you... You like what you see, and and you know we have a lot of costs to keep this up. And uh, I just want to mention that we ourselves we don't make any money out of this. Tolga, it's, could it's, you share your screen and show them that? I don't think you're uh, sharing. Sure, I'll try. Uh, yeah, if you could, because it's important to us. So if we can get this sharing going or the the subscribing going, we've got a lot more opportunities in the software we can use. And Believe me, we're we're running yeah, against some deadlines of them. Um, Am I sharing my screen? Their, yeah, you're. Unfortunately, it's me that you're seeing. Okay, there you go. Okay, so uh, here, here's my here's my screen. Uh, let me just move this share screen thing, right. and here's what I'm talking about. Right next to the chat, under the chat, there's a little dollar sign here. It's show your support for the Astro Imaging Channel. This is only available during when the show show is live. And I myself donated uh, some money last week, and it, it just helps us in the background how these things run. There, you know, we have to keep up the website. There is, uh, you know, there's all kinds of expenses for this. So uh, that's that's all. Okay, we're ready to have Terry take it. And Terry, you take over. Hi guys, uh, it's Terry. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear yeah. you. Great, great. Okay, so tonight's data that I've, I've uh, given to the Astro Imaging Channel comes from the Southern Hemisphere. It's uh, Terry. Are, do you mean to be showing your camera? Because all we're seeing is your your little kangaroo. Oh, I'm very shy. <laughs> okay. It's throbbing still, huh? Okay. Yeah. Let's let's have a look. Is it still throbbing? Yeah. Okay. I've got an issue with my camera. It's it's flashing. Uh, this data comes from uh, my observatory, which is out in the Australian bush. It's um, it's in a fairly dark place. This data set is spans multiple years, about three three years and three different cameras, and a bunch of calibration streams. So it's a bit of a challenge to bring it all together, and uh, hopefully you guys can work with it. Uh, what I wanted to do first is get the guys to actually give an eye uh, to give us a rundown on how they approach processing this data, and once they finish, I'll take over and show you how I've how I um, approach this sort of data. And then uh, we can just have a bit of a discussion amongst us and hopefully people can benefit from that. Uh, I guess I'll hand it over to Doug if Doug is ready. Yeah, Doug, uh, don't forget to unmute yourself there and yep, go for um, it. Okay, yeah. Doug, I'll, I'll hand it over to you and I will disappear for a bit. Okay, I'll share my screen.
And boom. See that? Yep, you're good. You're going good. Okay. So looking at this data, I was trying to find the best way to add narrow barn data to RGB, maintaining color, uh, but also getting the, the tremendous detail that was available in the narrow band data. And I actually had uh, three methods. Maintaining color. Uh, well, I'm getting this feedback somewhere. Can anybody hear that? You're OK. OK. So first, I tried uh, a starless uh, narrowband data, then with full stars, and then full stars narrowband plus HA channel combined. But basically trying to bring out the nebulosity, preserve car star color, and reduce the distractions of this uh, incredible star density. So the, the three images I came up with uh, look probably very similar to you. Uh, but uh, they're all done differently. But I was able to uh, eventually get uh, the details and the star color. So the processing software I used was Astro Pixel Processor, PixInsight, StarNet++, Astrophoto Studio Ultimate. All the data I registered with Astro Pixel Processor in Mosaic mode, and that automatically takes into account that the RGB was two by two. Then I used the standard uh, channel combination, denoised it with a multiple linear transform, photo ca photometrically calibrated it, uh, deconvolved the luminous data and stressed, stretched via mass stretch. The RGB data was stretched with arc sine stretch, which is uh, my preferred technique for to retain color and then combine to form LRGB. And so that's the uh, RGB, LRGB data that I came up with, the uh, final picture. So we don't really see the, the tendrils of the, the hydrogen alpha. We do see the uh, good color. So narrow band. Uh, First, I decided I'd remove the stars because adding the narrow band data to the stars often pollutes the, the color. There's a program called StarNet++, which is now a beta module for PixInsight. Um, I've been used for that. And it basically removes the star field, but it does leave numerous artifacts, which require, um, once again, noise reduction. Two, two steps, multi-scale linear transform and TV applied uh, with a mask applied. And then I use sharpening script by Harmut Bornman. Um, the uh, StarNet++ is a module by Nikita Mazura. It's a neural network that can remove stars from images in one simple step. And it's now available. You can get it on the uh, PixInsight forum. And uh, looking at the... Uh, H alpha data before and after StarNet it gets rid of all the stars, but there is noise, which you can see here. I, I then uh, did the noise reduction process and uh, pretty good, but it did dim some of the details. Um, now to get the data to go together, I'd used another very useful script, uh, emission line integration, uh, which is available at the uh, skypixel.at.pixinsightscripts HTML. And I added the data HA03S2 uh, in sequence. And so there's the original. There we add the HA. There we add the O. And then you start seeing the, uh, the reflection uh, data also showing up in the, the, the clear areas, the whitish areas. S didn't seem to do that much for me. And then the final image by this process uh, was there. And then reprocess it by not using the starless uh, versions and uh, better detail uh, in the bowl especially. And, on, and if I did a, a magnification of it, 
the left is starless and the right is full star. And I think it's uh, the clarity uh, on the right hand image is uh, considerably better. So I found the uh, sharper result by adding narrowband data with full star presence, um, better star color by adding narrowband data with starless approach. And then I tr finally tried another attempt, which was suggested by Warren Keller, by adding basically the HRA nonlinear to the final image using the channel combination in the CIE lab mode. And I thought that was, that was actually the best, the best image I got. Uh, very happy with that. And here's the detail. You can see all the uh, uh, details on the HA on that. Um, so that's it for me. I'm uh, sh shutting that off. Okay. Cool. Um, Toga, do you have any questions over there? I don't think I see any. And there's none. Um, no Toga. questions, but you know, a lot of uh, I see a uh, great job on the processing for Doug. And also, I'd like to thank the uh, Bill Cluxton, Ray Astrophotography, and Paul Gat Gatley for donating. We really appreciate it. OK. OK. Uh, John Grafe also did some work processing the, um, uh, oh, b before we do, before we go to John, um, uh, Doug, tell us a little about, uh, you're from Alaska, et cetera. No. Yeah, you're from Alaska, right? Right, uh, live in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, but in the winter I'm uh, down near Mayhill, New Mexico, where I do my astronomy. Up here in Alaska, there's in the summer there are no no stars except the sun. <laughs> How long have you been at this astrophotography stuff? Uh, well, seriously, for about three years. Okay, yeah, you're doing a great job. Okay, John, don't forget to unmute yourself, John. Okay, just you unmuted. You got it. And I'm going to screen share. And are you, you're not seeing it yet. Probably, there we go. Huh? We're not seeing your screen yet. Yeah, let me. Okay, almost there. There it is. Hopefully. Are you seeing it? Yes. Uh, yeah, but you're showing. There we go. Now you're showing me. Uh, OK, what do I need to do to see my screen? Uh, are That's you it. showing it's your PowerPoint? Oh, I got it. OK, you're, you're, here we go. You're showing the astro imaging channel is what you're showing. Yeah, there you go. Here we go. OK, and that should start to start the show. All right, so um, I, this is a slide to just show you what a newbie I am. Uh, you don't have to read it. Uh, this is probably my third or fourth image uh, processed with Pix Insight. It's, it's processed, processed entirely with Pix Insight. And I just wanted to thank, uh, thank Molly for turning me on to Kron's Light Vortex tutorials. They're amazing. And I follow them like a uh, cookbook. And I uh, have Warren Keller's book open all the time, and I use cloudy nights in the internet. And uh, I uh, review uh, the Astro Imaging channel frequently. So that's, uh, and, and I really want to uh, thank Terry and Alex for the uh, access to this incredible data. Um, I, uh, I, it really was fun to work with. Uh, this is my image. It, uh, it, it's uh, not nearly uh, uh, the image that images that Doug just showed us. And Doug, your uh, processing is amazing, especially that last image. But I'll run through how I got to this point. Um, and it's going to be very basic because uh, that's where I'm at. Uh, so when I downloaded Terry's data, I, I used the LRGB subs exclusively. I didn't uh, take any of his narrowband data. And of course, it's linear. And so the very first step was to uh, uh, auto stretch with screen transfer uh, function. Um, and then I prepared uh, the monochrome subs for color combination by registering them. And I used the SAR alignment process for that. 
star alignment found 492 stars for matching. So that's pretty good just using uh, default values and on the very first try. And um, the next thing that I did was use a couple of the dynamic processes uh, to uh, crop the image, get rid of those unwanted black borders and to uh, get rid of background gradients. And, and dynamic uh, imaging is just wonderful. You, you, pick, a, you pick a sub uh, in the case of cropping the worst sub with the black borders and, the, and any vignetting and you correct it there and it automatically corrects uh, the other subs. And for the uh, background extraction, you pick uh, uh, probably your brightest sub. In this case, it was the uh, loom sub. And put uh, markers down um, in areas that are clearly background, no stars, no nebulosity. And um, you apply the process, and out comes a, uh, uh, an image uh, with corrected background and it also shows you what was subtracted from the background and subtraction is the uh, format that I used. Um, then I uh, did linear fit which um, ensures that the histograms um, are equally bright uh, for each sub and I followed that with channel combination for the R, the G and the B uh, to give me an RGB image, which you see here. Um, and then I added luminance to the RGB to get an LRGB image. When you, at this step, uh, previously uh, we were working only with linear images um, and uh, LRGB process requires uh, that you have a nonlinear stretched image. So the quickest, easiest way that I found to stretch an image is to uh, uh, bring it up, is to show it with the screen transfer function, and then to take the little triangle in the corner here, apply process, and move it over to histogram transformation, and you immediately get um, a linear image. And the way you know you got a linear image is PixInsight tells you by removing that green line under the tag. So I added luminance to RGB with the LRGB process, uh, which you see here. Um, and the next thing I did was develop some masks because the next few processes that I use require masks. I made three masks, um, a uh, nonlinear uh, luminance clone mask, uh, which really you take the luminance I image, you clone it, and that is your mask. Um, and here you can see it in place inverted on the LRGB image. Uh, then I created a range mask using uh, the range selection process for mask generation. And I created a star mask. And uh, K-Ron describes a process for um, reducing uh, the size and number of stars. And I thought that that would be a good thing to do because um, uh, in my first trip through this data, uh, my stars were quite bloated and, and lots and lots of stars. And my understanding is that when you're dealing with RGB data, uh, especially RGB data that uh, has been going on for hours, um, you tend to get bloated in, uh, and large numbers of stars. So I made an aggressive star mask using uh, the processes that uh, K-Ron describes. Um, he, he starts out by applying HDR multi-scale transform process uh, to his LRGB image in order to neutralize the brightness across the image. And then he um, creates his star mask and he makes sure that uh, it is a pretty aggressive star mask, uh, lots of uh, stars in it. Um, and then he reduces star size with the morphologic transformation process. And uh, he, he dials up a 75% erosion to 25% dilation ratio. This reduces the size of the stars and uh, simultaneously smooths, it, smooths out their shape. And to make sure that he's got nice smooth shapes, 
his uh, pixel structure element is five by five and he removes the corners and that seemed to work really well. Um, so uh, this was on the top is before star reduction and on the bottom it was after star reduction. I was pretty happy with that. Um, I then went to background neutralization um, and color calibration. And this is a pretty knowledgeable group, I think, so I'm not gonna go into detail about how to do that. Um, but here is the image after background neutralization, color calibration. And I took some green tint out with the SCNR process. Uh, I then uh, did noise reduction um, using the uh, range mask and multi-scale linear transformation. And I, I did it twice. The first time I did it, I wasn't fully satisfied. Even the second time, I, I think I still had some noise and I probably could have been more aggressive in setting up my layers, uh, but I'll leave that for another time. And the final uh, thing I did was enhance feature contrast um, of the image with four different processes and in this order. Um, I went back to the HDR multi-scale transformation, um, which uh, Kron describes as, as providing magical enhancement to the dynamic range in the image. And it, it does it in the same way that it uh, neutralized the um, overly bright areas previously to make uh, the star mask. Um, I, I then uh, went to local histogram equalization, again with uh, protection with the range mask. And this recovered some of the brightness in the key features of the image. And then uh, probably my favorite uh, process for uh, uh, enhancing features, and I usually use this right at the end. Uh, usually this is about my third Pixin site <laughs> adventure. Um, you can adjust many different aspects of the image, including color, um, hue, saturation, contrast. And um, finally, um, I discovered a new, uh, new for me uh, script called Dark Structure Enhance. And uh, Kron recommends doing this um, right at the very end uh, to provide those finishing touches that give the darker details in your image an extra boost. Uh, and again, there's there's my final image. And um, shall I unshare my screen? Sure, Alex? go ahead and share it. Let's see. <laughs> um, I don't have any Rumble Talk questions. I think everybody on Rumble Talk has migrated over to um, to YouTube, which is kind of where we wanted you. Toga, what you got over there? No, Toga. Wake up, Toga. Uh, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Uh, uh, we we don't have any uh, questions yet. Uh, I'll just uh, we have a couple more donations. Tom uh, Chitty and Larry Groom. Thank you for uh, supporting us. Um, uh, we're very grateful. And uh, if you go back. Okay, uh, I think Terry wanted to say a little something too. Terry, why don't you take it from here? Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, you're in. Yeah. Okay, uh, should I start on my processing now, or? Well, you do what you do, whatever you feel is appropriate. Okay. We did John and okay. Doug on theirs. We had a couple other guys did, did some really good stuff too, but they they didn't show up. And later on, I'm going to ask you all guys. You know, we had four people contribute this time. This last time we had what ten or twelve people contribute. We were thinking that this would be something, this workshop idea where we provide some data and then people come on in and show us how they process it, um, would be useful to a lot of people and a lot of people would like to participate. But we need to know, you know, if it's not going to happen, we need to be kind of told that. We've still got one planned for next month, some very simple data and stuff like that. Um, and uh, before we go on, I'm, I'm going to, uh, Tolga, I see you got a question that is probably up your alley. Um, did you see that last one it's from David Fielder? Sorry about the silly question, but what are people contributing to? Don't um, you tell us a little bit about what's going on. Uh, sure, yes. So uh, we're we're a, a, a bunch of uh, guys. We're volunteers. Uh, you know, we run this channel. There are costs affiliated with this uh, running this channel. There, uh, we're going to create a nonprofit uh, organization, and 
none of us personally make money out of this. Everything you donate goes to running this show. And if we have to buy software, if we have to, you know, for ongoing expenses like the uh, websites, you know, I think, I think it costs $200 a year or I'm not sure, but the Rumble Talk used, uh, was costing us an additional $200. So we're trying to get rid of that. Uh, so that those that's what it goes to. Uh, it, it doesn't go to us if that's the question. Yeah, and and we don't want to make this sound like, and and here we're hearing from Oklahoma that's just sent in thirty thousand dollars and Massachusetts, yay, Mass. You know, no, we're not going to get like that. We appreciate any contributions, and you know, if it comes down to it, we'll continue to fund it out of the pocket. You know, just because we like doing it. But I mean, let's face it, it's a club, and uh, we appreciate the help that we can get. Um, yeah, so that, so that's far going on over there. Yeah, so far we have been paying out of our pocket, and notice we don't take sponsors. We don't uh, even the commercial outfits that come here and do presentations. We ask them to not to make it a sales pitch. We make them more informational, not like a, a infomercial kind of thing where buy 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 my product kind of a presentation. It was it's more about you know education. So we don't get money from anywhere except us. So far, we have been paying for this. Yeah, we, we've we've been asked by a couple of organizations that could certainly afford to sponsor us if they could just sponsor us and they could, you know, we could be their channel kind of thing. And we've said, thank you, no. So that's why we're kind of try, trying to stay out of it. Um, so it, it's just a club, guys, and don't feel any obligation. As a matter of fact, it's getting a little too colorful over there. Enough about the money. Let's hear about the software and the processing and the Terry take it terry okay uh i'd really like to thank both uh doug and john for coming on and sharing their processing uh, it was a big ask and their presentations and results were incredible i'll start off with my stuff right now um i'll just share my screen now is that coming through you're not sharing yet no there we go there you go oh, okay Okay, great. Okay, um, the data came from uh, my observatory, which is out in the Australian bush. Um, it's been running for a number of years. This data spans several years, about three different cameras. So I had to bring that all together into the masters that I presented and gave to you guys to work with. The initial calibration is done through CCD stack. Um, and from there, I'll move, uh, and from there, I move it into the uh, my formal processing, but. I'm going to take you along how I process the data. And I think it's a bit of a running joke with everybody in the Astro Imaging channel that my processing takes a very long time. <laughs> OK. So I'm just going to look at the really a conceptual level of how I actually attempt to do my processing. First thing I like to do is get really comfortable, just examine the data. I stare, I spend an extremely long time just staring at the data. And I'm looking for any features that work together or work against each other. At that point, I come up with something in my head, I see a goal, and that's what I work toward. Now, um, just this morning, I thought, hey, Terry, you didn't actually go and look at anybody else's results of what the colors really do look like. So I, I had a bit of a look. This image comes from Robert Gendler. This is uh, his rendition of the large magnetic cloud. The object that we are focusing on is right here, and right in the middle here. And it's just off where the tarantula nebula is. So you can see the colors, there's a very slight reddish cast to the background. <coughs> um, the, the, emission, the emission nebulas have a nice kind of a reddy pinky, more on the pinky side. And you can see where the hot area is. There's quite, quite a lot of hot gas in this area. So the first thing I do when I grab my data sets is I just stretch and stretch the data. And I'm looking for any things that sort of pop up that take my interest that I might not have seen initially. At the very beginning, I create all of my star masks. I create all of my gradient masks. All the masks I'm going to be working for the entire data set, I create right at the very beginning. And the reason I do that is the data is in its natural form. So the stars are at the right sizes. So when you start processing your data, all that stuff 
changes slightly. So I like to do all of my mask creation at the very beginning. This is the initial data set on the left-hand side. That is the RGB combination. Now, at this point, this is bin data, as everybody has said, and we can see that red cast is actually there. At the, from here, I brought it into PixInsight. I did the photometric calibration, and you can see that the fit was actually quite good. One of the side effects of this is that it does act as a background equalization as well. So if you have some extra gradients left over, it will take care of those. And it looks a little more pleasing at this point. And there's no processing here at this point. This is the, again, back to the R RGB data. What, what do we have to work with here? As everybody mentioned, we've got a very, very dense star field. It's, it's actually quite a terrific star field. There's a lot of colors. There's a lot of blue stars as well. There's a bit of nebula present that gives us something to work with. And those colors are very, very interesting. We'll come back about those colors and those nebula in the nebula a little bit later. But it is a good base to work with. Next, I go on to the narrowband data. Same deal. I stretch it, have a look at it, and just look at the relationships. We have the O3, the S2, and the HA data. You can see with the O3 data, there's some nice contrasty areas. I'll be using up for my blue. The S2 component has a lot of filaments running throughout, and they actually help with the HA data as well. The HA data is very strong, very dominating in this, which is can be an issue. Weightings. You can weight your data when you bring it together. So the top image is, is a one-to-one -one weighting of the S2, HA, and O3 data. You can see it has that really strong, strong green component coming out. But if you weight it slightly differently, the bottom guy here, it looks more like an RGB. It's the same data, simply different results. What I have is a half weighting of S2 and the HA together to make the red channel. The green channel is oxygen, about 85% of that, and about 15% hydrogen. And the blue channel is just O3. If you you could use this as a base as well, but it does change the color cast of the stars slightly. The top one has those those magenta stars. Now I'm just exploring the data at this point. Now I start combining broadband and narrowband. So this is a hydrogen and a red blending, and this again is me just looking at the data and seeing well, what kind of interesting features can I grab here. You can see there's a lot of filaments running all through the bottom, especially in the bottom left-hand component. There's a lot of really subtle dark light areas. What I've done here is I've brought the S2, the O3, and the HA together in a monochromatic image. And you're going, hey, does that look flat? Well, the intent of this is to bring this in as a synthetic luminance data later on. Now, when you're dealing with your luminance, data, they will tend to have a very flat look to them. If they look really sharp, when you add them with your color, it'll just be washed out. This is, a, this is uh, combining all of the narrow band and the broad band together. This would be probably too bright to use in any sort of uh, LRGB combination. It would just make everything turn pink. Now that you've become a little more familiar with what the data set is, you start thinking how each one can support one another and just how can I put the sucker all together? Back to our original data. Again, this is our bin data. You look at the star colors. Um, and what and what, do, what does it tell us upon it? Now I'm going to ask uh, both Doug and John if you can turn on your microphones. At this point, where would you want to improve this data? Can you think of anything that would help? Uh, John, your microphone's still mute. Oh, there we go. Um, this is where I thought uh, the stars were too prominent, and I decided I would uh, um, redu uh, reduce the size and number. Yep, the stars are distracting, I would agree, yeah. And the nebulosity is kind of lost in the background as well. Definitely. 
Yeah. Okay, so we'll move on to the next next guy. So what I did here, again, this is strictly RGB. So this is our bin data. So all I did here was simple curves and saturation adjustments just to give it an element of depth. The stars look a little bit smaller. Is there anywhere else? Again, we're just moving through. This is not a final result. Is there anything else we, we can do to improve this? Uh, the reason I went a little bit, you know, brighter with the colors here is because I threw luminance on top of that and straight away you can see the difference well, let's just go back so I've super I kind of saturated this a little bit our star is a little bit big and then as soon as we drop our luminance on top of our lRGB representation the colors snap into what they should be so I, I typically work on my luminance different uh, and then I lay that on top. I don't do a lot of heavy processing. What I like here is those really subtle blues popping through there. They're not over the top. Okay, this is blowing up uh, maybe 200% or more just to show you the um, what the star colors look like. So we have a lot of blues. This is this is a very interesting part of the sky. There's a lot of hot, hot stars. Uh, I think uh, Eric was saying when he first looked at this data, he said, oh, look at all the blue stars. We just don't get that up here. The chart on the side shows roughly the temperatures of the stars. So what else can we do to make this guy pop a bit more? Well, to do that, I'm going to start throwing some narrow band data into our mix. So this is my first uh, attempt at throwing a little bit of narrow band with the RGB component. So we're going to do a bit of contrast enhancements, and I've done some high-pass filters. The majority of this processing is done in Photoshop. And then I've started blending some narrow band, the S2 and the O3 component in, to give me those lovely blues. So we can look at the differences and how they compare. So the original guy was our LRGB version, and the guy on the right side with, was with the addition of the S2 and the O3 data. It actually enhanced the contrast and the saturation. If you look at the nebulosity, you can see there's more reds coming through, and there's more blues coming through in there as well. And the stars look a little bit nicer and a little bit smaller. Okay, this is my initial attempt at combining the rod band and the narrow band together. This is an LRGB combination with the synthetic luminance from the earlier slide. The synthetic luminance is blended with arc sign stretch RGB image to enhance the colors. Uh, my goals here were really to just try to retain the stars because they are truthful, they are there, and try to show some of the details. At the first, I thought, oh, I was pretty happy with this. And then I went to bed woke up the next next day and I thought not not happy with it so then I um, I went back and did another reprocess and can you see the difference between the two so Doug Doug and John yeah, this version here I think it was a little bit too heavy-handed with the narrow band data it looked a little bit ropey here the colors look a little bit more truer to an RGB representation and they're not as ropey Okay, so now we're going to get into narrow band and false colors, and I really do have to put my disclaimer here, and I'm sorry, but funky colors may follow, okay, guys? False color is really a way to help us with looking at the different contrasts of the different emissions. It's really a scientific tool to help visualize what you're looking at. The true color is what you see with your eyes, all the stuff that you would naturally see. False color is basically a contrast for features. There are no really heavy rules here, but I think the end goal should be something that's fairly pleasing to look at. So how did I go about creating a false color image? The first thing I did was create tone maps for each channel. The top one is the S2 component, which I use for red, middle DHA, and the oxygen is on the bottom. What these are are high contrast images with the stars removed. They're only used for the color component. You're not worried about fuzziness or anything. It doesn't really matter. I do combine them into a color image, which is on the top, 
and then I take my synthetic luminance that and lay it on top and that suddenly makes it pop from here it's just your traditional lrgb processing any techniques that you have you can do this in photoshop you can do this in pixinsight well, this is my initial attempt at combining the broadband into a hubble palette so i wanted to keep the subtle structures all through the bowl area and the wispiness coming out throughout there are no no rgb stars in this color rendition I think the narrow band star colors seem to work quite well. In fact, I tried an L uh, I tried laying in the RGB star colors, and it that made the image look a bit funky. I didn't really like the look. So I can I can hear everybody saying, "Now look, man, you've wrecked my 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 eyes. I have nightmares of wacky colors attacking me when I'm walking <laughs> through the night." So let's get back to this classic monochromatic image here. I actually do like this here. I do like black and white images. What I've done here is I've taken the best of every channel I had and lay and layered them all in together. I think there's a little bit of um, depth in the sky. I really do like monochromatic images. What about now? I'm going to move into something called composition. When I look at this guy, I actually see a cute little puppy dog there in space, He's just looking at you. But what happens when you take away his favorite toy, the ball there? He flips upside down and becomes this scary looking monster. I actually think this this orientation really gives a lot of pop. You know, I see this scary monster with two big eyes with this big, large cavernous mouth in there. It just has a lot of depth to it. So don't be afraid to spin your images around and have a look at it. I guess in summary, really, really take a, a long time looking at your data. Don't rush it. Look for the relationships between what is captured in each filter. They can work for or against you. I actually use a lot of my failures to enhance my result because your failures will, can have a lot of wacky contrasting things. You can blend those in and you might get some very, very interesting results. And don't try to accomplish too much in one step. And the most important thing is back away Revisit your work in a few in a few days with some fresh eyes. So the, uh, these are some online tutorials or or references I'd recommend. Um, I I can't recommend Adam Block's uh, videos highly enough. His stuff is excellent. Given the amount of content he covers, they are they are excellent value. There's an article on tone mapping, which is uh, how I did this image. Uh, in fact, this is the first real tone mapping experience I've had. It's a pretty interesting technique. And there's a couple from uh, articles on combining the LRGB with narrowband, both in Photoshop. And uh, they, they actually work quite well. And there's a list of where some of my images are. are in fact, I just posted this image as we are talking uh, up onto Astrogen. Uh, any questions no uh, yeah I think we're good on questions everybody uh, has really run away with the donations and we really appreciate that we, we want to be clear here we're trying to cover expenses uh, is all we're trying to do um, I mean we still want you to use those comment things on both on rumble talk and in the YouTube to ask questions about what's going on, make comments, having your own little arguments over there and everything else. But I don't see that there's, there's been a lot of compliments and things like that. But um, I, I, I was, I just want to say, Terry, that I was particularly impressed with the um, thought processes you went through in doing what you were doing. I, I go back in my brain to what Adam Block told us not long ago about, um, um, about how you have to decide what it is that you want to talk about um, when you're making an image, um, you know, decide what kind of a story you want to tell and things like that. Obviously, you take a lot of, of care of um, analyzing your images. You're, you're doing more than just applying uh, techniques. You're trying to get something out of the images. And that, that was, I think it should be very instructional for everybody. And um, 
I guess the only comment of importance was was in the room itself. There was a few comments on you misspelled colors several <laughs> times. But uh, other it than that, you know, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I think there's only one country one country that spells it C O L O R. <laughs> um, yeah, but that yeah. doesn't make us wrong. <laughs> <laughs> My 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 daughter lives in the Czech Republic, and uh, she gets everything right all the time. She's a very good student and stuff like that. And um, she got um, marked off on her on her test because she takes a shower. You know, the, on her English test, she takes a shower, and she's supposed to have a shower apparently in Oxford, England. Um, that's how you would get a shower: is you have a shower instead of take one. And she's still upset because she takes a shower because she speaks. English. She doesn't speak this Oxford stuff. But at any rate, <laughs> that was a wonderful presentation. Um, uh, Doug or John, is there any reactions you want to add to this conversation? Yeah, this is, this is John. Uh, Terry, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. You gave me some really uh, a lot of food for thought. And um, I wanted to uh, thank Alex for making this data available. And anybody who uh, uh, has any thoughts about uh, working uh, with high quality data should take advantage of this. I, I know I certainly will, and I'll spend a lot more time thinking about composition, Terry, as I move forward. So thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. And I was also I'm happy to make this available to everybody because uh, this show has been a great resource. Um. Uh, Tolga, I think we have a comment come or a question from John Adastra over there. Uh, basically, John John is asking Terry, how would you work with just the narrow band data if that's all you had? Sometimes, you know, with working in light pollution and stuff, that's um that's all he's got is narrow band data. So, what would you have done if you'd only had narrow band data? Uh, it in fact, this image presented on the screen here is just narrowband. I would probably come up with this here in the end. Um, there's, is, is, there's no RGB component in here at all. I've got quite a few images that I used to do from the city, which which look reasonable, um, all narrowband. You know, I've just again taken taken the time. I, I I probably can bring some up for you if you want to want to see. So let me do a quick yeah. search on there for you. Yeah. Time. We're going, yeah, we're fine. Okay. So uh what I'll I'm just gonna grab one one of my favorite ones I've did a while ago that came from the city. Well wait, you know what? You go yeah. ahead and look at that. I didn't ask uh, John a question that I wanted to ask him, so I'm gonna ask him that. You you pick out a few you might want to talk about. John, okay. I didn't ask you where are you from, what's your image chain conditions, how long I think you spoke a little bit about your experience. Um, what else do you have to tell the folks on the Astro Imaging channel? So I'm from San Diego and I live right on the coast. We've had uh, this uh, um, haziness and cloudiness and uh, uh, fog for two months now. It's, it's awesome. It's, it's what we call the June boom. <laughs> yeah, but this is July, Alex. <laughs> I know. Uh, I know. We, uh, we have an RV and we go camping a lot. And when I go camping, I grab my grab and go which is a 72 millimeter uh, refractor, and I put it on a uh, uh, Sky Guider Pro and and a tripod, and uh, and just love being out in in nice dark skies. When I'm when it's clear in San Diego, um, I have uh, two telescopes: an eight inch Celestron um, and a, uh, a 90 millimeter. Uh, stellar view and the stellar view is set up with uh, on, uh, off axis guiding and two cameras. And um, I, I forget his name, the fellow from Louisiana, Red, uh, Red Stick Astro, uh, but he gave a presentation on how to get all your electronics and wires together. And I have duplicated what he did, and it, it's made a huge difference. So I thank Molly for turning me on to Kron and I'll thank the fellow from Louisiana for getting me organized. And okay. that's pretty much what I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tolga, uh, I'm not Tolga. Uh, Tara, you ready again? Ah, uh, yeah. So um, I just grabbed a few of these. This 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 here is a bicolor image. That's taken from Melbourne. I I live about 
15 kilometers from the central of uh, from the central business district of uh, Melbourne. Melbourne's about 4 million people. So this is, again, with the same telescope. It's a 10-inch RC. Uh, and uh, this is just a bicolor image. You can, you can get good stuff in the city. Uh, if you zoom up on this guy, you can even see you can even see uh, Ida Karina and the shell and all of the puffy being pushed off the uh, off the uh, off the star itself. It's, a lot of the renditions of this object show a a big bright area. It's not. It's actually elongated, and you can see. I, I don't know if you can right here. There's little sh little puffs of <coughs> being pushed off the surfaces of the stars and interacting. So you can do high quality work from the city. Uh, this guy here was. Um, was whoops uh let's grab this is taken from the city this is um this is actually bin data i was trying to uh speed it up so uh it came out okay um this is the Sorry, first i have a question yes when you um right now currently you're on dark site but yes do you take narrowband data in True darkness with new moon, or do you save your narrowband uh, exposures for the moon? For the moon, right. So yep. my my point is asking that question is actually I, I knew the answer. I'm trying to highlight something with the question is the fact that really when you're shooting these narrowband data from the dark side, you really not you have light pollution. You're right. It's another form. It's broad. It's broadband as well. Whereas from the city, uh, the narrowband stuff. Um, isn't really affected by the lights because it's all sodium. It's 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 a different frequency. The new LED lights that they're putting up everywhere that's a bit harder to that that can interact with your stuff. You'll get a a uniform gradient across your image. Uh, there's a lot of LED lighting going up here. They're removing it and putting it up now. But you're right. In uh, when I'm out at a dark place, I do all of my narrowband when the moon is up and it, it is another form of light pollution right that's what i'm trying to highlight is that narrowband is really our tool to uh equalize between a dark site and a city site hmm. so there, there's not going to be that much difference uh between a fair you know fairly light pollution city versus a dark site the narrowband data that comes from those two yeah, it, yeah, they're, they're very, very similar. Because you know, like I'll be imaging forty degrees away from the moon. That's you know, that's pretty close. You you might get a, a bit of a gradient across, um, but yeah, you're right. The the data is very, very similar, and I use fairly wide, wide filters. Mine are seven nanometer, and I have a camera that's bland. It's very, very blind in those areas as well. It's you know, it's the old. Um, STL camera, the 11,000 chip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very inefficient in those spectra. I think about 15% 15, 15 efficiency in S2. Probably, you know, mid 20s, 30s for maybe o, uh, for the oxygen and hydrogen. But it still works okay. But and so yeah, we do we do have gradients to worry about out out, out in the in a dark area as well. So, okay, go ahead. I just yeah. wanted to bring that up, you know, just to make a point that, you know, you could do all these images from a light polluted area with the right filters. Correct. Like this, this image here, you can do from the light polluted area. And this is, this is a, was a fairly tricky image. It was pointing uh, at an incredibly bright star in, um, uh, I called it. Uh, I call it chicken ridge because it's in, it's in the running chicken, which is uh, which has a lot of buck globules in there. These really dark, dark, dark contrasty areas. And um, this is this can be done from the city. There's there's no difference. Um, I I don't think I don't have any experience with the very narrow narrow band filters like three nanometers and stuff. Um, I don't know how much of a difference that would make. I suspect it could be more contrasty, but I'm trying to get as much light as I can into my system because it's pretty slow. Any other questions?
Oh, that's it for now. Okay, and I I did just publish that uh, this this guy up on Astro Bin just now while we were talking. Cool. So if you um, you, you guys have, did, yeah, you guys did a great job tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to go back to the PowerPoint presentation, share my screen, and some other things. Um, boink, boink. So I should be sharing my screen. This is what we get to look at. We've got four different, five different things to monitor, uh, but that's the one I wanted to show you. And uh, back over here. Okay, this is this is as you can see. If you go to workshop on our website the astroimagingchannel.com, you hit webs the workshop, you will get a page that looks like this. And I want to point out a few things. Even if you can't read them, you, you know that they're there. Um, tomorrow morning, if I get my act together after doing the taxes and stuff, tomorrow morning I will rewrite this web page so that this, this it will say uh, um, M13 from Alex and uh, you know tell you what to do and how to do it and stuff like that. And um, then I'm going to move the information from Terry's stuff down to the bottom here. Remember, this is the second of these workshops we've done. The previous workshop has M42 data, and that data is still there. You can still go out and get that data. You can't upload it anymore, but you can still get the data by clicking on that link. It'll take you back to the previous show um, and in that previous show, you can get the information about how to get uh, the M42 data. And by the time I get this rewritten in the morning, it'll say M13 from Alex, and you can get previous workshop data from M42 and the da data from the 1968 that we just did. So I'd suggest you you go do it. I didn't um, see any, I Go ahead, Toga. I just wanted to say, uh, remember what happened. Um, so when you guys uh, process submit the data, uh, don't worry about if the, your image doesn't show up on the on the bottom of the page right away, because we have to approve your uh, just to make sure that you know somebody doesn't post the inappropriate image. We have to appro approve the your picture on the back end. So uh, be patient when you submit the picture. Give us a day or two to uh, go through the submissions and approve them. To show up on the bottom, yeah, and that that folks. I mean, we don't want to talk too much about money, but it costs us seventeen bucks a month to have auto approve. It's that kind of stuff. We have to look at some of those ways we were spending money before. Um, so so we're approving individually now, and frankly, I got to get in there and approve it, and I'm kind of lazy. This link here for. Somebody's marbling the data there. Somebody should get muted um, for the noise, the audio. Um, here is the link for the um, data. Tomorrow morning, it'll be appropriately placed over here, I hope. Here's the way I did my M13, but you're welcome to do it however you want. Most people don't bother including this little galaxy up here. But anyway, you do what you want. Uh, I did not see any conversation going on about why we only had uh, four people participating in this workshop. And, um, or if this workshop is even, if it's going to be a popular thing and we should continue doing it. So uh, please use your contact uh, on the Astro Imaging channel and tell us what we need to know about whether we should be continuing the this particular um this particular effort or not, and we'll take it from there. Um, I do we have anything more in the chats? In the chats, uh, Tolga, or um, where is Eric tonight? Uh, Just a, a lot of thank yous and appreciation. Uh, people are saying keep up the good work. So um, yeah. I, I think this is a good idea. I think we should continue, uh, you know, maybe once a month, maybe once every other month, uh, we can have a challenge like. Uh, you know, processing workshop. Cool. Workshop. Uh, uh, incidentally, both Rumble Talk and the YouTube comments have that link to the data. If you don't want to wait till tomorrow morning to start processing that M13, so you can copy that down and go up and grab the data. It's just for tips and stuff like that. And now it's time to say good night to all our family. M no, okay, stop that. We're going to stop broadcast.
Good night, everybody. Happy Bastille Day. See you next week. And those of you who are in the room, don't forget to stay in the room. So bye, everybody.